Hello, and welcome back to DeepRob for discussion eight, where we're gonna be talking about rigid body objects and give a prelude and sort of introduction for our upcoming seminar presentations uh, following spring break. So what are the presentation topics gonna to be on? Well, we're gonna be talking about these rigid body objects from a few different perspectives. Um, so in seminar three, so the first Tuesday lecture after spring break, we have a set of papers that are gonna be covering um, how we can use object pose once we've defined how to, how to actually uh, represent object pose for our rigid body objects, how we can model the geometry for rigid body objects using uh, neural networks you, in the form of sine distance functions or other implicit surface representations. And following that then in seminar four, which is our Thursday lecture, we're gonna be talking about a set of papers that um, cover some really interesting um, descriptions and representations for objects based on, uh, based on learned feature embeddings. So uh, these are gonna be from the standpoint of dense descriptors where you try to actually represent local and global properties of rigid body objects using uh, deep neural networks, or also category level representations where you have varying shapes within the same semantic category for different objects, and you wanna somehow describe the geometry of those objects at the category level or the pose of the objects at the category level, uh, which introduces some really interesting challenges for our for our network architectures. So these are gonna be some really exciting presentations, I think, coming up after spring break, and we're gonna be looking forward to those. But with that, the purpose then of today's discussion is to provide some introduction and to give some context that could help sort of lead into these upcoming seminar talks. And so in today's discussion, what we're gonna be talking about is sort of like a classical set of representation techniques that have been used for rigid body objects um, as a way to ground then our discussion of the deep learning-based techniques. So as a bit of a recap, uh, we just finished up our week on 3D perception, where we saw how we could combine the color images that we get from our color RGB camera sensors with these depth images that we get from our depth sensors as, saw, as a new form of input for our deep neural network architectures. And so we saw in the seminar presentations how combining this RGB input along with this additional depth channel input can be beneficial for our networks to perform a variety of, of perception tasks that now have to account for 3D space, so beyond just the pixel coordinate space. And so this week, what we're gonna be looking at, and in this discussion, what we're gonna be talking about is now the rigid body objects that compose these 3D scenes that we're trying to perceive. So to start with, let's take an example of a rigid body object in this scene, which could be our robot, potentially. Um, and so how do we define a rigid body object? Well, a rigid body object is defined as one where there is uh, no deformation possible within the object geometry. So another way of saying that is we will consider a rigid body object one in which every pair of points that would lie on the surface of this object remain at a constant distance. Um, so there can be no deformations within the object itself. Assume no matter which external forces or internal forces are being uh, exerted on that, on that object. And so you could imagine in the case of this digit robot, like picking any pair of points along the, uh, along the body. And if digit is, an art, is a rigid body object, then those points in 3D space should never um, change their relative distances, no matter how digit moves. Um, and so probably what you're starting to question is whether digit actually is a rigid body object. And so this was a bit of a trick slide because really digit is not an actual example of a rigid body object. Um, because for example, on those shoulders, because they can rotate around one another as digit walks, the, the, you know, the, the distances between two corresponding points are, is gonna change as digit moves, as it articulates. And so for that reason, digit is actually what's called an articulated object. Um, so we're not gonna um, be talking, I think, too much in this upcoming week about articulated objects, but this does present an interesting set of challenges that we should think about. Um, and so one thing that I just wanted to point out with this uh, notion of an articulated object is just to give you a sense that um, how we represent objects doesn't stop with rigid bodies. We can compose rigid bodies together through, uh, through joints that can actually articulate to compose more complex structures like articulated objects or other deformable objects. But in this lecture and in this discussion, what we're gonna be focusing on is just rigid body objects. So let's take an example of an actual rigid body object, which is the torso of the digit robot. So the torso of, of digit is one of the 
specific links within the overall robot, and uh, we'll use it as an example, kind of like a motivating example going, going forward. So the two questions that we're gonna try to, um, try to sort of set up and answer in this, uh, in this prelude discussion is, is these two questions shown on the slide. So first, how can we represent the 3D geometry of these rigid body objects that don't have deformations? And then the second question, which is gonna lead into our next week's seminar presentations, is really what role can deep learning play given the representations that we would like to, uh, to use to describe these sorts of objects? So let's look at this first question in a little bit more detail. All right, so how are we gonna represent this 3D geometry of digits torso in a computer? Um, well, the computer graphics community for a long time has been representing rigid body objects. And so as a starting point, what we can do is we can lend their representations for our robotic use cases. Um, so at the core, what most of these representations are gonna do um, is they're gonna use what, what, what we're gonna call an explicit representation of the geometry. So what that means is we're gonna actually describe specific points that are on the geometry or specific surfaces on the geometry um, as a, with, without any deep neural networks yet. Um, so in the case of an explicit representation, one of the core components that goes into this representation of the geometry of this object is gonna be what we call vertices. So this is just a set of 3D coordinates in space that lie on the surface of the rigid body object. So we can imagine in the case of this digit robot, essentially like placing 3D points on the surface of the robot um, throughout its overall structure. And so these are, you could think about these as being essentially like sampled points on the surface. Um, so each one of these has a 3D position in space. So if you pick out one of these points, it has some X coordinate, some Y coordinate, and some Z coordinate in a 3D space. And so what that is implicitly setting up in this, with this set of, of vertices is then a coordinate frame. So like some origin that these points in 3D space are defined with respect to. Um, and so this origin becomes a really crucial piece of information, but because when we wanna go and describe where the overall object is within space, we're gonna need to know where this origin is because that is then what defines our vertices, which is one of the components of our representation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in one of the upcoming slides. Um, but so for this first component of our explicit representation, we have just these set of sampled points in 3D space that lie on the surface of our rigid body object. The second component, which is generally gonna be used in explicit representations, is a set of what are called faces. And so these faces are just polygons that are made by connecting subsets of our vertices that lie on the surface of the robot. So what you can imagine doing essentially is if you pick out certain um, points from our vertices set and you define that, those, those set of points as lying at um, the corners of a triangle, then you can imagine sort of like placing these different triangles in 3D space um, that have corners at each of our vertices. And in total then in the composite of those faces, you're gonna end up with some approximation for the surface of our rigid body geometry. So of our rigid body object. Um, and so you can imagine then that as you use an increasing number of vertices and an increasing number of faces, so like an increasing number of these polygons, you can approximate increasingly complex surfaces. So you, to, to a smaller degree of error. So even to the point of curvatures, um, you, can, you can actually use these triangular faces or these other polygon shaped faces to represent those more complex or like those kind of um, um, non-flat, non-planar surfaces on the geometry. So, right, so if we increase the number of vertices and increase the number of faces, the thinking goes that we could actually model this, this torso of digit, which has curvatures on it. For example, like in the LIDAR portion, so where my cursor is up here, this LIDAR um, sensor on digit's torso is curved. But within it, with enough vertices on that portion of digit, we could potentially model that, um, that, that curvature with a low amount of error. And so, that is what an explicit representation is going, to be, is going to be composed of. So they're going to have a set of vertices and a set of faces. Um, but that's not all, right? So digit, for example, has color. It has an actual pattern on its, on its torso. And so what we might want to do with an explicit representation if we want to fully model the object is also model that color information. And so the way that explicit representations do this is they use what's called a texture mapping. So the idea here is you'll have some image file. So for example, like, like this image here, 
which represents the pattern or the color information that the object that you're interested in modeling actually displays once it's been um, once it's been visualized in the real world. So, so the idea is like that this this image here is capturing all of the visual information that we want to, our our um, digital model, our explicit representation, to also capture, so that we could render maybe our explicit representation in a computer graphics engine and actually get out some rendering that looks like the actual rigid body object once we are viewing it with our color cameras in 3D space. Um, so what does this texture mapping do? So we have this texture image, which describes the pattern or the color information. What the texture mapping does then is it uh, describes, like, the, like its name suggests, a mapping from pixels in the texture image to specific faces that we described on the, on the object geometry side. So if you imagine essentially taking the pixel from your texture image and placing it on the face from your, from your set of, of faces that we described on the last slide, and you do that for all of the, for all of the points in your texture mapping, then that will give you uh, what color should be essentially like positioned at every one of the faces on the geometry. And so in, com in total, that'll give you the overall texture of your, of your rigid body object. And so a few things that are, it's worth um, noting here. So when it comes to geometry files, there's a few set of canonical file representations that you'll typically encounter. Um, so one of the most common is what's called a .obj file. Um, so this comes from a company called Wavefront Te Technologies. So this is one of the um, sort of like older representations that you'll see pretty commonly. Um, that's actually the file that we're using to, to render out the, the digit model on this slide. Um, but you'll see some other common file formats. So this isn't all of them on this side, but PLY files, <clears throat> STL files, which is also one of the oldest formats, <clears throat> and then Collada files are also uh, fairly f common file formats. <clears throat> so what do these files actually look like? So if we open up the OBJ file for this torso, um, this is the actual OBJ file, or sort of like a, a sample of parts of the OBJ file that were used to render out this torso object. So if we look at it, what we can see is, so in that first line, what it's doing is it's referencing the actual texture information. So it's, it's essentially referencing that, oh, there's another, there's another file named uh, torso.mtl, which describes the material or the texture information for this specific OBJ file. Beyond that, then, what it does is it sets up uh, just a set of vertices, you can see here, as each vertice being just like three numbers, so that X, Y, and Z coordinate. And then below that, after there's a very long list of vertices, um, it then defines all the sets of faces. So what, so what these are doing, these integers are then referencing the specific vertex index, indexes that make up uh, the points for this specific face. Um, so if you look through these um, these common geometry file formats, typically this is the structure you'll see, where they'll um, they'll set up a set of vertices, they'll define a set of faces, and then potentially they'll um, import some texture information. Certain file formats will also define the normal vectors to each of the faces on the geometry. And so what the normal vectors are doing is it's describing um, whether or not that face, when viewed from a specific direction, is is either inside of the geometry or sort of like external or like externally facing outside of the geometry. Um, so that can be useful for for rendering engines. But not all file formats will store the the surface normals. So and and just putting out so a surface normal is a vector that is um, perpendicular to a specific uh, surface. So. Um, um, but not all file formats will, will use that. So for example, like the .obj file format doesn't actually store surface normal information. Okay, so now that we have this explicit representation set up where we have a set of vertices and faces that make up the overall surface of our geometry, and then we can use a texture mapping to describe color information or uh, patterns that would exist on the surface of our geometry. The next thing we should think about, um, oh yeah, one other quick point on on these geometry definitions is it's worth thinking about where they actually come from because they're pretty expensive to create, right? So you can imagine um, if you're wanting to describe all the vertices on this torso, um, there can be thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even like hundreds of thousands if you have a complex enough geometry. Um, so it can be a really expensive process to set these up. So typically where these geometry definitions come from is either human artists that take the time to essentially like digitally sculpt, uh, for lack of a better term, what the 
what the like these digital representations for vertices and faces are for some object that they're interested in. Um, so you can find um, examples of human created um, geometry files pretty commonly, but these two like Sketchfab and CG Trader are two pretty big um, platforms where artists can post their geometry de definitions. This is worth noting because like, let's say hypothetically that you're working on a project and it would be useful for one of your perception algorithms to have the known geometry for maybe an object that you're trying to estimate the pose of or the object that you're wanting to grasp. Um, it's then a challenge to actually come up sometimes with the with these geometry definitions. So, um, so, so what you can do sometimes is potentially like define them yourselves if you have skills in in uh, 3D modeling, so like CAD software techniques, um, or you can hire some external artist uh, or designer to actually create the object file for you. Or potentially, what you could do, and what I would say is potentially like an increasing area of interest, is use software to actually create these object definitions for you. So through what's called photogrammetry, you can actually have an algorithm that'll take in a set of images and actually estimate then the geometry in, described in this, for, in this fashion as a set of vertices and faces for you. Um, so these photogrammetry algorithms um, are increasingly getting pretty good and there's actually deep learning that can be used within photogrammetry. Okay, so given this definition of our of our explicit representation for a rigid body object geometry, the next thing that we should think about is how does this fit into our notion of a 3D scene and the 3D world? So to describe where a rigid body object is positioned within 3D space, <clears throat> we refer to that positioning as the pose of the rigid body object within space. And so within pose, we are describing the position as a translation within space, and then also the orientation of the object with respect to some uh, world coordinate frame. And so let's look at a little bit more details of what that looks like. So imagine that we have some scene. So inherent then in that 3D scene, there's gonna be some world origin. So where my cursor is down here. So some point in space where the, along the three dimensions, the specific um, like coordinate measure for those three dimensions is zero, zero, and zero. So that point in space in the, oh, in the overall scene is what we typically refer to in robotics as the, as the origin of the world coordinate frame. And so in addition, because this is a 3D scene, there's going to be three axes uh, that are essentially bases of, uh, of the 3D space. So there's gonna be some X axis, some Y axis, and some Z axis that we assume is defined sort of for us, or somehow for a given scene, there, there has to be some world origin, some world coordinate frame that's, that's been defined. And so if we want to then position our object geometry somewhere within this world coordinate frame, what we do is we can define that the positioning, the pose of this rigid body object using a transformation from the world coordinate frame to the local coordinate frame of our object geometry definition. And so this transform, which would transform you from the, uh, from the local coordinate frame of the torso into the world coordinate frame is how we actually describe the pose of our objects within space. And so we've, we've referred um, to these as six degree of freedom pose for a few times within this course for, for some of the algorithms that we've looked at, like pose CNN, for example. Um, the reason that we call this pose information as six degrees of freedom is because to describe both the position and the orientation requires six degrees of freedom. So there's three degrees of freedom to describe the position. So you can imagine a translation along X, a translation along Y, or a translation along Z which would each be one degree of freedom. So total, there's three degrees of freedom for your translations. And then orientation information, um, which you can think about maybe as like an Euler angle representation. We have some roll, some pitch, and some yaw, um, also has three degrees of freedom. And so composed together, the, this positioning and this orientation, these, um, these poses, these, which, are, which we can think about as being synonymous with, with a rigid body transformation, they come from uh, what's defined from, from group theory as the special Euclidean group three. Um, so the main thing, like maybe the most important property of this, of this SE3 group is that it preserves Euclidean distance. So for describing the pose of our rigid body objects in space, we're assuming that these rigid body objects are truly rigid. We're never gonna deform space in a way that would cause points on our rigid body object to become closer or farther apart than they were before the transformation, before the positioning within the world coordinate frame. And so these transformations, they can be decomposed 
for for conceptual thinking, and this makes it like a little bit easier to think about, they can be decomposed into a rotation transformation first, followed by a translation transformation. Um, and so rotations commonly are expressed as quaternions um, for the purposes of, of deep learning. So Euler angles are conceptually nice for us humans to think about, but they have some, some issues numerically for actually computing with. Um, and so quaternions are nice because they can alleviate some of the some of the, some of the issues that come up with Euler angles. So if you're curious, I'll link um, I'll link in the slides to some to some external reading about quaternions. Um, but it's useful to know that typically with deep learning, you'll see quaternions used in place of of regressing Euler angles. Um, in addition, translations then are expressed most commonly for deep learning. They're expressed as just like residuals, so just as deltas along each of the three dimensions. Um, but taken together, this rotation and translation is how we'll describe the pose of our object within, within space, within a 3D scene. So given this definition then of how we have uh, an object geometry defined as a set of vertices and faces, um, we can also then describe the pose of our object geometry in space with this rigid body transformation. Well, how could we then think about the scene as being composed as a collection of rigid bodies? Well, the thing to sort of think about is that essentially every rigid body within our scene has its own local coordinate frame, which can be positioned with respect to the global coordinate frame. So a 3D scene really can be thought of as a collection of many rigid body objects, each of which has their own pose with respect to the world coordinate frame of the scene. Okay, so given this setup now for how we have our rigid body objects and we can compose scenes as a collection of rigid body objects, why might this be useful? Like, why is it useful to have some explicit representation for an object geometry and the pose? <clears throat> well, for model-driven robotics, having a notion of an, of an explicit representation is extremely useful. So if we know what the exact object geometry is in terms of vertices and faces, and we know where these objects are positioned within a 3D scene, we can then use that information for many pre-existing robotic algorithms. So collision-free planning, where you'll try to search for a trajectory of maybe a robotic manipulator, like an arm through space to avoid colliding with, these, with the vertices or faces of all the objects because you know where they're positioned. That's one example of where you can use this explicit representation with, with pre-existing model-driven robotic algorithms. In addition, path planning or obstacle avoidance, where maybe if, if you're an autonomous car and you can detect where a person is within the 3D scene and you want to then detect or uh, avoid colliding with them, this is another case where if you know what the geometry of that person is and you know the pose in the 3D scene, you can then plan your, your path through the scene um, to avoid collisions. In addition, if you know what the object geometry is of, of certain objects and you know where they're positioned, you can then pass that information to some task planner, so a higher level planner, that could actually produce some plan about which objects maybe to operate on first based on where they're positioned within the scene or which objects are even in the scene in the first place um, or which objects your gripper can potentially manipulate or not manipulate based on the known geometries in this explicit representation. So there's a lot of potential use cases for this explicit representation. But having said that, the deep learning community recently has been finding roles for deep learning to actually model rigid body objects using deep learning. And so there's a number of different approaches and sort of like perspectives that have been, um, that have been used for, for applying deep learning to rigid body object modeling. And so in next week's seminars, we're gonna be looking at a set of these, of these kind of directions and uses. So potentially we could, as we've already actually seen, we could estimate the six degree of freedom pose for some, for some rigid body object. Um, so the question here might be sort of like, how do we perceive from some visual input or tactile input where these objects are, are existing within the scene. But these models might assume that you have this explicit representation of an object geometry, and you've defined what the local coordinate frame of that object geometry is to actually estimate the pose. So sort of like follow-on methods or maybe like more recent methods have also been looking at how you can actually represent those object geometries themselves with learned functions, with learned networks, in place of those explicit vertices and faces. So the works on implicit surfaces and sign distance functions are gonna to try to answer this question of how can we actually model an object's surface implicitly? Sort of like bake the object model's surface into the parameters of some learned network in place of those vertices and faces that have to be, be explicitly described by some 
human artist. Following that then, there's been some really interesting work looking at how you can actually extract features, both the local features and also the global features that, um, that taken together would describe an object geometry. So dense object descriptors is gonna to try to answer this question of like, how can we extract features that are meaningful to describe um, objects maybe across classes in this fashion. And finally then, category level rep representations tries to set up this, tries to answer this question of how can we model a geometry and a pose for objects that have different shapes, but fall into the same semantic category, right? So we might not want to have a separate six degree of freedom pose estimation algorithm for every instance of, a, of an object within a specific class, right? So if you have mugs that are, have varying shapes, but all are mugs, how could we maybe describe all of those different shapes in a way that would facilitate still performing those downstream tasks like pose estimation or grasping um, how can we describe those objects in some way that's at the category level and still useful for those downstream tasks? So we're going to have a really interesting set of papers and presentations in next week's seminars, which I'm really excited about. And with that, that will end up, that will wrap up today's prelude discussion. And I look forward to seeing you after break.